So I wanted to interject here that there are places in the country where lawyers prefer to do the adjustment of status step, that last step, actually in the immigration court. Um, every jurisdiction has different delays and backlogs, and in Arizona, for example, and in Texas, they sometimes do the last step, they get the visa petition from immigration approved, and then they complete the case in the immigration court. So really depending on where you are, here in New York, it's a preference of the court and our preference that we do it um, through the USCIS. Last hypothetical, it should test your knowledge and help you solidify what you've learned. Jaleesa is 16, born in Guatemala. She comes from an indigenous family group, which is pronounced Quiche. Her father left Jaleesa and her mother and four siblings when she was only two years old. The mother later remarried. Jaleesa left school after the sixth grade to work and support the family. Again, not an uncommon exit point in education in Guatemala. She worked at a butcher shop beginning very early in the morning. This is based on one of our real cases. When we asked her if she had dangerous work, she said no, but the interviewer noticed that there were scars all over her hands. She used a machete to chop chunks of beef. Um, sometimes only light in the butcher shop was from the stove. Last year, her stepfather was told to leave his farm by a group of young men. She thinks it was a gang that picks on the Indios, or the indigenous people. Stepfather said he didn't have any way to do that if he left the land. He was later shot and killed, they think, by the gang. Jaleesa's mother has told her she has to go to the U.S. now as the oldest child to work and to find support for the family. She was apprehended and she's been released to her aunt Juana, who lives in Suffolk County, New York. So Claire, my first thought is this is a case for asylum, mm -hmm. that um, Julissa or Jaleesa is someone who has suffered persecution. She mm -hmm. suffered the death of um, her sorry, her, the stepfather. Mm -hmm. She suffered uh, out of fear for her family mm -hmm. and the indigo, Indios, that means she's part of this indigenous mm -hmm. group that might be national origin mm -hmm. or race or a particular social group is definitely suffering. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason you might pick asylum for this case versus special immigrant juvenile status? Sure, I think that's a reason because we don't know um, what Julissa's relationship is, but we think that she probably has a pretty strong relationship with somebody back home, and that could be her mother. And so if she secures asylum as her relief later when she has her permanent residence, she becomes a citizen and she's over 21, she'll be able to sponsor her mom. However, the asylum case may not be completely secure, and also I'm kind of worried about Julissa right now. Yeah. So it might be a good idea to go to family court with her aunt Juana in Suffolk and get that guardianship order, yeah. also for Julissa's care, concern, and permanency, and seek the special immigrant juvenile findings that she's been abandoned by her father. Now the father did abandon her very, very early when she was very young. There is New York case law that says the abandonment does not have to be recent. So would it be in Jaleesa's best interest to return to Guatemala? I don't think we think, think so, so, where she wasn't able to pursue education, where she had to work in a dangerous environment. Um, however, if she pursues her green card through special immigrant juvenile status, she won't be able to sponsor her mother or her siblings. All right, so that is the end of that hypothetical. Uh, we'll keep going past law students. Okay. Next step, more trainings. Uh, our website asks you to fill out a volunteer form. I don't know, Joe, we can work that out with you how you'd like to organize it. Uh, if you can't consider taking a case, we would accept financial donations. And we hope that you'll join us in being one of the best, a lawyer who does pro bono and helps this community of children who are in tremendous need. Again, our cases, we find 80 to 90% of the children qualify for relief, but they won't be able to navigate all those. I can see your eyes glazing over <laughs> when we talked about the forms and the courts and the procedure. Imagine doing this alone at the age of 14. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, if we, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You guys were amazing, and I think we all know that we can do it. Um, anybody who's got lingering doubts that might be a little intimidated, just like you, like Lenny said, think about the four-year-old or the twelve-year-old trying to figure this stuff out. What chance do they have? They don't have any. We can do it. We have the support. Safe Passage is with us. They're in the courtroom. When you go to courtroom, you're going to recognize them, and you can go up to them and say, "Oh, hi, Lenny. Hi, Claire. Hi, Susan." They're going to be there. They have mentoring attorneys. So when you're doing an application or a brief and you're just not 100% sure, email the mentoring attorney. 
If, if you can't get a hold of them, I'm here. Greg Brescia is here. Laura Alou is here. We we'll all support you. We have all the written materials. You can do it. With us, they have a great chance. Without us, no chance. So now I'd open up to any questions. And I would just say, if, if, to the degree you would like it, uh, we also assign trained law students to cases, and the students don't do this for money or for internship credit. They're doing it for their pro bono hours. They make the same commitment you make to the life of a child's case. The only time we let them out of that commitment is if you ask us to or if they're about to join the federal government in employment post-graduation. But we've had many of our law students really stay in touch with the kids, and we also have a, a group of college students that are working with us from John Jay. They're public service stars. They competed to get paid positions from the college to be our paralegals, professional um, guides, uh, peer mentors, and work as interpreters. So we also will share pleadings with our pro bono lawyers. We put a lot of resources on the website. We don't put all of our pleadings up. Generally, we're a little worried about um, people just trying to pro se practice guardianship law or immigration law without um, knowing what they're doing. And also there's uh, some people that do do this work for money um, and they sometimes do it very well, but we also would prefer to have a close mentoring relationship with you. We want you to succeed and most importantly, we all have one big goal, right? Protect the child. So questions? Yes. So the first question, repeat, yeah, yes, repeat. first question is, do you have to pick and choose among your choices of relief? Absolutely not, and we have many lawyers who pursue both, either simultaneously or in series, and again, we'll help you make that strategic decision as we were trying to do in that last hypo. Julissa might have a very strong asylum claim and feel strongly she wants to pursue that for her mother in a reunification, but at the same time, she needs a legal guardian here in the United States, so we might get that guardianship process started. Number two, um, a child, once they have secured the family court findings and you're waiting for the adjudication of the visa petition or you're in adjustment of status, it is extremely likely ICE is going to have agreed to terminate the removal proceeding. So they will be someone called an adjustment applicant. There's a term of law called residing under color of law, and in New York State, they're very generous about that interpretation. Any time that you have a visa petition pending, an application pending, they'll often consider you to do that. I'm not worried about someone being apprehended or removed during that process. Also, these children are frankly not the priority of the government to deport. It's expensive and difficult for them to do that deportation, and they're not entirely sure where they're deporting children to. They are deporting people. They are ordering children deported in absentia if they don't appear in their court hearings. Um, there are three flights of people going every day to Guatemala that are being deported, and we know the Guatemalan government greets them, screens them, and then releases them the same day, basically. So children go back to homelessness, street kids, um, and sometimes real danger. So another great question. Anyone have any others? You know, can I maybe anticipate a question? How many hours does this take? What am I signing up for? Well, I guess I would say to you, just like any matter you get, you know, the partner says, I want you to write this 12B6 motion. If it's your first one, how many hours did it take you? Oh my God, mm -hmm. right? That first motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. Maybe you went to the partner and you said, how long should I anticipate this will take me? And he, and he said or she said, oh, you know, two days. And then you felt bad because it took you seven and you stayed up all night about half of those, right? When you're first learning any legal procedure, it could be you know, kind of onerous, but we guesstimate for you that you should anticipate 20 to 40 hours of interviewing and preparation for an asylum claim, and that may be on the low side for your first one. And then another 10 hours or more of preparation for the interview and then appearance at the asylum office. But if you're successful, that's not a lot of hours for you to have completely changed someone's life. In a special immigrant juvenile case, because the family courts all vary, and whether you're doing custody or guardianship or it's some other kind of proceeding is going to vary, it's very difficult for us to predict. Some of the courts upstate, for example, judges are so happy to see pro bono lawyers, they've even allowed us to arrange to do it all on one physical visit. Do the testimony, make the motions, do the filings, accept the service, waiver of service, I mean really facilitating it. In Suffolk, they allow some of the filings at first by mail, as in Nassau. Um, so, I would say you want to budget 20 hours for the drafting and preparation of that guardianship petition and maybe again, you know, 10 hours of preparation. I cannot tell you how long you may sit in family court because as important as pro bono is, 
They think the life of every kid in front of them is equally important, so they do not move the cases around just for pro bono counsel in the New York courts. I see another question over here. So the question is, would a lawyer normally be assigned one case or more than one case, and what is you know, a pro bono lawyer's expectation or commitment with us? I mean, I, I think the very first thing we want is we want you to take a case if you're committed to taking the case. And so some of the larger firms do make teams because a lawyer might be pulled into trial, into an essential deposition, have to be traveling, and so they want to maybe have a backup team member. We ask you to think about, from a child's perspective, not making the teams too large. Uh, you may have to rotate a new member in at some point, or maybe thinking about the stability of working with one of the law students who might be available ongoing throughout the case and be the, the point of continuity if you have to have a team. Uh, we would probably suggest you only have one case yourself at the time, on, with the one exception I would say of siblings cases, because it seems much more efficient and effective you're going to do the same arguments for both of those kids. Maybe you want to make your team augment it by one member. Claire, did you want to add to no, that? No, I think that's very comprehensive. I mean, the one thing we would ask you to think about is um, look at it from the client's perspective. And we, the, the children are incredibly appreciative. Last year, for the first time, when I created this project, I did it just as my pro bono work. I teach a full load of classes on top of this. This is not all that I do, right? So I'm doing this pro bono just like you are. Sometimes at 2 in the morning, I'm reviewing somebody's brief, because that's the first time I could get to it. But we will get to it. But because the workload has grown, and because we have so many great pro bono lawyers, we've been able, happily, to do some private fundraising. And we've raised some additional mentor attorneys who will help and support you. What we would like you not to do is take a case and then call us and say, oh, you know what, I'm giving you back this case. Um, really, we are a conduit, but it's your case. You've, you're going to engage in a representation agreement with that child. Now, we're not going to leave the child alone. We're not going to let the case flounder. But we don't want you to think of, well, you know, I got a little busy. I'm just going to give this back now. Hopefully, if the firm makes the commitment to the case and you're going through Joe's coordinating that, I gather, you're making a commitment to the case. And it's also because of the child, right? A lot of these young people that we're seeing are young people that have been abandoned in the past. So making a new relationship with somebody and then having that person abandon them, that's an additional uh, layer that that young person doesn't need. Yeah. Just one other thing I would suggest to maybe you think about wherever location you're working with these children is thinking about where you're going to meet them and work with them. It's obviously most cost effective and efficient for you to have it here at your office. Um, Claire and I got through security, but then I couldn't make the little scan work. <laughs> I don't know. It just didn't work. Somebody had to coach me. I got through me. because the man helped me. Yeah, someone helped. So yeah. what about if you do have your client meet you here, you meet them downstairs? Or have a staff member meet them downstairs? Yeah. Maybe think about your support staff in the office, someone who works in the mailroom, someone who's a secretary, someone who uh, works in other skill sets in the accounting office. Maybe they would like an opportunity to be part of a pro bono team, and they can be that kind of connector with the client. It's very different than your insurance or corporate clients, right? Um, checking in by text, checking in, you know, how's it going this week at school? Um, do they have enough food? Uh, do they need a winter coat? Uh, we partner with The Door, a fantastic social service agency here in New York that also has a legal team. All the children can get food assistance, health care assistance there, and happily in New York, children under the age of 19 almost universally qualify for health insurance, so we can help you with that as well. So don't be intimidated. It's going to be really fun to represent these children. And last year, when we were raising money for the first time, our biggest check came from a group of school children up in northern Manhattan who won a competition and they got us a check for $5,000 to give to a community-based organization that's really changed their lives. And that was a, the biggest donation we had from any particular donor other than my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, any more questions? OK, I'm really looking forward to working with you. I'm very excited. And um, we have cases ready and yes. waiting. So let Joe know when you're ready to go. Cases are ready. <laughs> Everyone, thank you very much. <laughs>